Lord is my shepherd, I shall be not in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me in all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. You guys sound great today. I appreciate all the, the way in which we're able to sing together and all the good things. Gabby's just doing a great job with this. And it's so beautiful just to be able to be here and be able to worship together with so many people who are really into it. So we've been talking about peace here lately and some of the things that go on and may take away our peace. And then we started Psalm 23 last time and talked about our shepherd and how the Lord is our shepherd, but specifically the Lord is the shepherd of my want. So he says, you will not want because you have a shepherd. And because you have a shepherd, you don't need all the other stuff that maybe you think you have to have. And so God does take care of us. And it comes down to that basic thing. Do we really trust God to take care of us? Do we think he's going to do what's good for me? And the, the psalmist puts it in terms like he leads me in green pastures and quiet waters and he restores my soul. And all of those are great images. If you were a sheep, what else would you want? I mean... You've got great pastures, you've got great water, and uh, today we seem to want a lot more than that. I mean, after all, Black Friday's coming. You have to buy something, because it's all on sale, right? I mean, there's got to be some way to buy something that either you need or somebody else needs, and so we get caught up into that. And there's a the second part of this psalm that we want to look at especially today because he does talk about the Lord is my shepherd but then we come to verse 4 and that's the part where he says even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death even though the Lord's a shepherd and we have all these great things even though there are those other times when things are not so great there are those other times when things don't always go the way that they're supposed to, and sometimes it seems like a very dark walk. Certainly death is around us, and we've seen this recently. But I think it's more than that when he looks at verse 4. We walk through the valley of the shadow. And this might be more times when we're in danger, times of darkness, times when things are not going right, and for whatever reason, it's not one of those times when we're able to rejoice and able to understand and able to be with God. And so this is what he begins to talk about. There are those times. And there are times when danger is there. But the psalmist says, I will not fear because God is with me. He has a rod and a staff. I think if you were a shepherd, you knew how to use tools it was not just a matter of shouting at the wolf, hey, get away from my sheep. Uh, staff was there to rescue sheep. I think that's the way they used it. I am not a shepherd. Do not pretend to be, but I think that's the way that they used it. The rod, or that was more of a club. If you're not doing what's right, then yeah, there's a way to protect the sheep and you can take care of the wolf if you've got the club. God has both sides. God has the care and protection of a staff that would draw us in. He also has the rod that says, you're not quite doing right. And so maybe you need to straighten up a little bit more here. When we look at David, the guy who writes the psalm, we look at 
the times of danger that he faced, and there are always going to be times of danger. I mean, even crossing the street can be dangerous, especially if you're going across Dana. You have to watch sometimes because sometimes those people are driving crazy as they pull out of the church parking lot. Uh, but there are many times when David found himself in danger. I mean, from the very beginning, he describes his life as a shepherd of being around lions and bears who might come to attack his sheep. We know of the incident with Goliath, and that was a very dangerous time, and yet David seems to have faced that and come through it. And then we read about the times with Saul, where there's a whole army who's chasing him. And Saul has, a, I mean, David has some followers, but nothing to match the army of Saul, who are all well-trained men. And you look at this, and David seems to constantly be in distress and constantly be in trouble, and there's all kinds of situations like this. David not only has that, but there's a constant battle, it seems, from the Philistines, who are always coming to attack his nation. And so as they come to attack, God will ask. In 1 Chronicles 14, God, you know, David asks God, should I go up for battle? Will you deliver them into my hands? And God says, yes, go up. And sure enough, the, the battle goes his way and God delivers him into his hands. And it's no, no issue. But then you already kind of knew beforehand, right? If God's going to already give you the battle, then how dangerous is it really? I mean, you do have to go fight. Yes, there are swords involved. Yes, there are spears involved. And yes, you could die there. But God already said, I'm going to give you the battle. So, I mean, you kind of know the ending of the story. And so, go ahead. The passage I want to look at next is in First Chronicles 14 again. Sorry, I was supposed to show you that earlier. In 1 Chronicles 14 again, because this is right after the first battle, and this just simply says, And the Philistines yet again made a raid in the valley. And David again inquired of God. God said to him, You shall not go up after them. Go around and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then go out to battle. For God has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as God commanded him, and they struck down the Philistine army from Gibeon to Gezer. And the fame of David went out into all the lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all the nations. And maybe that's the one thing that impresses me so much. We have battles, but when David has a battle... He goes and he asks of God, should I go fight? Is this one that you're going to be in? Is this one that you'll deliver? And he seems to ask that each time as he goes, well, why wouldn't you? I mean, don't you want to know if you're going to win? It's just a simple matter of saying, God, are you going to be with me in this one? And certainly that's what happens. God seems to always be there. The first time God says, yes, go up and fight. And so he does. And the second time God says, no. Well, doesn't God want me to win? Don't you think God's on my side? We're God's people. We're God's nation. So, I mean, what's the harm, really? I just wanted to know if he's... David follows exactly God's plan. And it's amazing because God says, no, you don't go up and fight. I'm going to start this one. Wouldn't you love that to happen in the next battle that you have? For God to come in and say, just take a break for a minute. You circle around behind and we'll chase them into each other. I'm going to start this one. God will go before you into this what a great thing to happen and that happens because David always asks so do we always ask I mean we get into those situations in our distress and in our trouble hopefully not too many battles but 
where we find ourselves and if God is for you and it's his plan to win the battle, is it really danger? Is it, and God just says, yes, God has gone out before you. And sometimes we need to ask, sometimes we need to read the book, sometimes we need to pray, discern the plan of God, realize, understand what it's really all about. Because we are in this with God and we're able to see how he works in our life. And it is truly amazing to watch as he is the one who's always there for deliverance. David experiences that, wins a lot of battles. Not all of them, but wins a lot of battles. When you look at the life of Jesus, he is also in danger. We would think perhaps that uh, someone who is the son of God, who has the power to create anything he needs to create or undo anything, or but he finds himself in danger. And there are many times like this. One of those is not found in Luke 8. However, his disciples seemed to see the situation differently. He says, one day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down upon the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, master, we are perishing. And he awoke and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? Well, sometimes you can see things coming. This one they couldn't see coming. So sometimes danger is unexpected. You didn't really think about it. You didn't know about it. You're out just for a leisurely afternoon sail. And here the storm comes and the wind comes, which I understand could happen on this lake. And so it, all of a sudden you are in danger and it's not looking good. And it says the boat's filling up. You're about to sink. And they come to him and Luke's version says, we are about to die. I mean, there's no question, there's no doubt in their mind. We are done for. We are about to die. And, of course, Jesus, being now woken up, rebukes the wind and the raging waves. I just love how Luke says these things. The raging waves. Have you been in a boat with raging waves? No, anyway. And they ceased. And Jesus turns to them and goes, where is your faith? It's like going to a movie. And you go in and you pay your money and you sit down. You know it's going to be an action movie. And so within, what, 60 seconds, the first fight starts. I mean, there's a danger. There's an earthquake. There's a big stone rolling at you. There's something that's going on that's about to get you. And sure enough, the Hebrew gets killed and you're done, right? You still got a full box of popcorn there. <laughs> Wouldn't you feel cheated then? But the truth is we know it's only 60 seconds into the movie. This is just the first scene. He's not going to die because the movie would be over. And you can't have the movie be over. That would be the end of the story. The hero never dies at the beginning. Any book you read, he doesn't die in chapter 4. He's going to wait till the end until if he even dies then. And chances are good that he's going to, you know, win and succeed and do everything perfectly. Can you tell where you are in God's story? Why would you be afraid... In chapter 1, there's a lot more to the story. God is going to deliver. Are there dangerous situations? Yes, there are dangerous situations. Jesus says this is not one of them. It is only the beginning. It's our first time. We're just now out. We're just, don't you understand? It's not going to happen now. There's more to the story. Can you see the headline? Jesus Messiah drowned at sea. 
everyone will be saved? No, it's just not going to go that way. I mean, it would accomplish the same thing, right? Jesus died, but God doesn't do it that way. And we know that. But somehow the waves look really big, and so we become afraid and we allow our imagination to run away. And so the question is, does this feel like the end of the story? And if it doesn't, then get ready for something amazing. Because God's about to do something great, because you're looking at all these things that are threats, danger. In fact, it records this is danger. They were in danger, and... Jesus gets up and says, don't be afraid. Where's your faith? Have you ever tried to wake up God in your life? Maybe that's what we need to do most. It looks bad. It looks terrible. Wake up God and make sure that you're paying attention to him and he's paying attention to you. David asks about every battle. When's the last time we ask? And maybe we get more scared just because we face things without asking. We face times where we didn't wake up God and, you know, invite him to your life. Invite him to the things that are going on if you're scared. As Jesus gets closer to the end of his life, we see the threats all around him. And certainly is headed toward a cross. He understands he's headed toward a cross. And the last night in the upper room, he talks to his disciples about peace. And so in John 14, 27, he says this to them. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And so he's saying, I'm going to give you peace. Well, but wait a minute. It's his peace. I'm going to give you my peace. Jesus, your life doesn't look real peaceful right at the moment. I mean, you're within a few hours of being arrested and probably less than 24 till you're dead. Does that seem like a peaceful time where Jesus says, I will give you my peace? Absolutely. Because of the way in which he handles all of this, I'll give you a peace that goes so far beyond any situation or circumstance, you'll know that you can be secure with God. I'll give you my kind of peace that lets you go through it and come out the other end with a God who loves you. Does that seem like peace? Yeah, it might get rocky. It might be dangerous. There might be things that happen. And either you're going to have this amazing salvation or you're going to come out the other end and be with God. And so as you look at this, he promises peace. He promises the Spirit will teach them He will bring to their remembrance, which means you had to have learned something first, okay? He can't bring to your remembrance if you never learned anything first. And so a little bit of study in the Bible would be important, talking to other people. But as Jesus is headed to a cross, he gives them his peace. It's the peace of God. He faces people who are going to lie about him are going to abuse him but that's not really danger to him either because of where he's going at the end of this section in John 16 verse 29 his disciples said "Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. 
In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus knew all this was coming. It is an expected danger. You can watch it. It's not an unexpected thing that comes on you suddenly or jumps out of the closet or, or comes racing across the lake at you. This is something that you see coming. You know it's going to be there. You know your life is in danger. You know that it's going to be difficult. You can see it coming. And Jesus says, I want to give you peace to handle something like that. Because we tend to panic. And the disciples are finally at the point where they believe, and it's like, okay, good, but you're going to be scattered. You're all going to run away from me. However, I am not alone because God is with me. Because you're at peace when you know that this is right, that this is what God wants, that this is the thing that he wants to accomplish. And so he's able to talk about his death on a cross. He's able to meet with Moses and Elijah. He's able to say, I see it coming. I know it's coming. I know what's going to happen. And why would I be worried about it? If I already know it's going to be here, all I have to do is get through it. I don't want you to think of that the next time you get scared is what's the way through it? Not somebody take it away from me, but how do I get through the middle of it? And so I think that's one of the most important things about it. He says, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have problem. You're going to be seeing accidents, and you're going to be seeing things that happen on purpose that are going to make your life very, very difficult. But you will get through it. And then you come out the other side. It's not that th some things are not expected. We know that they're coming. I saw this. This week, peace is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of Christ. And that's really where we find ourselves. The Jews had been planning to destroy Jesus, and sometimes we know it's going to be bad. And yet, it's what God wants. It's his plan. And Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Well, that's great. And that's the guy who is going to give us peace, the guy who has overcome the world, at least peace from the mistakes we've made, peace from the sins that we have, not necessarily peace from accidents are still going to happen. There's going to be a storm, not in Arizona, but there's going to be a storm somewhere, and maybe that's why we live here. We are able to find peace from sin. We are able to find grace. We are able to find all these things. But we do have to accept it. We do have to follow him. And so how do we do that? Will we join with him in his death? Well, that's what we were trying to avoid. But that's the way through it. Is to join with him in his death. Our death to ourself and our life to him. Our burial in baptism. Our walking in the valley of the shadow of death is what leads to a new life and he gives life because jesus comes out the other side of the valley seated on the right hand of the throne of god and so do we what a tremendous thing we're afraid of many things we're afraid of a car crash how many of you have ever been in an accident that's a lot. Your car looks like this, right? Maybe worse. Well, how horrible. What's going to happen now? You're going to call your insurance company. It's a lot more horrible if you don't have insurance, by the way. Please get insurance. And so that takes away some of the sting out of it. But your car looks like this. And so, okay, it's crashed, it's wrecked, and, you know, what do we do? We take it to the body shop and we get a new car, right? They fix it and now it's done. Okay, what were we afraid of? We were afraid we'd crash. When you crash, you fix it and then you go on. Does that make sense? Because sometimes I think that doesn't make sense. No, we're gonna crash. 
yeah, and then you fix it and you go on. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to commit sins. We're going to have tragedies in our life. And then we pray to God, and he's able to bring comfort, and we get through it, and we go on. There's times of danger that we didn't know about, like with the car. There's times of danger that we do know about, right? You didn't accidentally get in that raft. <laughs> Nobody threw you in there. In fact, you probably had to pay money to get in that raft. Is that a time of danger? Absolutely. We could drown. It's exciting, isn't it? Man, I'd love to do that. Wouldn't that be great to go rafting down the Colorado River, huge waves, except for the one person screaming in the back going, we're going to die. <laughs> then why did you get in the boat? <laughs> I mean, some things we know are coming. We see them coming. We plan for them. It's what makes life exciting. And once you get through the rapids of it all, it's the same river, and there's peace. And it's the same thing that happens with God. We do this a lot of times. You can see the zip lines through the trees, right? What, are you crazy? 20 miles an hour hanging on a wire, zipping through the trees? I could fall. Or you could have fun. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, do not fear. Chances are it's not going to be fun. It will be exciting. It may not be fun. And the one thing I know is you will get through it. And if there are times of sin and mistakes and failures, we will get through it. Because God allows that to happen. We did it to ourselves most of the time. We've caused our own disaster. And God allows us to get through it. And we're able to make peace with ourselves. Because most of our fear is about the unknown. Become afraid of what might happen. Well, there could be some great things happen. Sometimes I think failure is good for us. We need it in order to grow up a little bit, because if we're always afraid of it, you know, the first time you fall down and skin your knee, it's horrible. You need the magic Band-Aid. By the time you've done that 50 times, it's, it's just a skin knee. Put spit on it, wipe it off, it's fine, let's go. <laughs> We've got stuff to do, and so you're ready to play. We need to get through the disasters, and sometimes we have enough to be able to get through them. They make us better people. And having faith in God is faith in what the future will hold. And having trust in God that he will protect us and take care of us. Unless he wants us to learn something, or unless we need to be an example for someone else. Or in case there's a sacrifice, but it's all peace with God about what God wants to happen. It's peace with God about salvation. And we can be at peace about salvation, about heaven, about hell, about punishment, about reward. None of that is scary because you already know what's going to happen. And we absolutely know that we have the way to deal with all of this. When we repent of our sins and we're baptized into Christ, those sins are taken away. All mistakes are gone. Everything is out of the way. And everything that would say you don't have peace can be gone from your life. And it starts us over. We form a covenant with him that we will show up for each other. That he will show up for us, but also that we will show up for him. Now, if you don't worship at all and, you know, kind of forget about him, please don't expect him to answer the next prayer real quickly. He'll treat you like you treat him. 
That's kind of one of the golden rules, I think. God wrote it. You ought to understand it. The more you show up for him, the more he shows up for you. Both of you promised. And he will give you peace in the middle of tribulation, in the middle of this world. Peace away from sin, peace with a Savior. So that hardship and disaster don't take away your blessing. And we'll talk more about blessing next week. My question today is, do you have peace? Do you have this kind of peace of God that he's able to put in your life? Boy, if you've become a Christian and contacted the blood of Christ and walked in that valley of the shadow of death, you've got peace because you know he takes care of you. If we can help in that in any way, would you come while we stand and sing? <clears throat>